guess what I was driving? If you guess a Franklin automobile, then you were right. Franklin was in business from 1902 to 1934. Franklin had many firsts in the industry. The first to use aluminum pistons. They built a range of cars all the way through V12s. Unfortunately, 1934 was the end for Franklin, but it lives on. We're here at the Northeast Classic Car Museum where the largest collection of Franklin automobiles is housed, and it's not to be missed. There are just a wide range of things for you to see, and you need to come on down. Hey, you've seen this car in previous episodes. It's the Rover Air-Cooled Twin. But long before Rover had an air-cooled automobile, Franklin Motor Cars of Syracuse, New York had developed a car. We're gonna take a look at a few of those cars and see what they're all about. Hey, what's going on here? This car has a radiator grill, but no radiator. Well, it's a Franklin air-cooled car, and instead of the radiator, what they actually have is a large blower to blow air across its six cylinders. Now, this car is a 1930, and it was near its end of the production for Franklin over the 30 years that they were in business, and this being one of the last cars, or the last four years of production, had probably the most advanced six-cylinder engine at, at its history. But one of the things that Franklin should really be credited with is the number of firsts and the developments they made from 1902 forward. Franklin was one of the first cars to use aluminum pistons, and they pioneered that. They're one of the first companies to use the heat exchanger in their uh, um, exhaust system. They're one of the first companies to have developed a air-cooled system that was reliable for large sedans. So in the 150,000 cars that they produced, this is one of the fine examples, and we're gonna look at a few others. So we're here in Bovard, and we're looking at his 1910 Barrel Hood Franklin. Now this is a really eclectic car, and of course we've got an eclectic owner and driver as well. He's gonna tell us a little bit about this car and how this engine is, is uh, configured. So, why this car? I used to read books on cars, and they talked about the Franklin with their concentric valves, and none of them could explain it. I couldn't figure out how it worked from the description, so I figured the only way to find out for sure is to buy one and take it apart. Is huh. that a good enough reason? So, so if you want to take something apart, a Franklin's a good place to start, I guess. Right. So why don't we start with taking apart the uh, hood? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, strap is on it. I've already unbuckled the strap. <laughs> and the hood just comes off and set it in the grass. And then you can work on the car because there's no radiator being air cooled. Ah, uh -huh. so, so you can just work on the car right there. So we've got uh, four cylinders here. We've four got, uh, and these are the concentric valves we were these, discussing. These are the concentric <coughs> valves. This is, this is the exhaust valve. That's the upper exhaust valve. And then you have the inlet valve. Ah, I see, and concentric sure valves. Very. Uh, the exhaust manifold, or excuse me, exhaust porting is actually going through the inlet valve, and it's a big hollow bell. Really? So that, yes, really. Wow. I can, maybe I should get out diagrams. But anyway, you notice that the, the whole engine's in a draft type box, I think is the proper way to say it. And the flywheel is a suction fan, and that draws air into the box past the fins on the cylinders, which is exactly where you want your cooling. So every cylinder is cooled equally. Very clever arrangement. Other things that are clever about it, it has t it's a dual exhaust in that you have the exhaust up here that's controlled by these valves, and you have another set of exhausts down here that is ported by the piston. So when the piston comes down, it opens a port, blows the exhaust out uh, into this manifold, and that one has a muffler because it's that first bark, or the first expansion of the uh, gases in the cylinder that causes the bark. Yeah. So you put a muffler on that. But you need valves 
because the, when it comes down the next time, you're on your suction stroke and you don't want to suck in the exhaust from the other cylinders. So you have a valve that closes off at that point. So quite an arrangement, almost almost two strokeish in, no, in no, a way. No, no, no. In a way where you're opening them. Four, four stroke. stroke. I know, I know, but but and in the, the way if, if it was two stroke, you wouldn't need that extra valve. That's right. That's right. right. And but it turns out that uh, many aircraft engines from 1910, 1915, before World War One, used that system. Well, after Franklin did it, Franklin started in 1905 using that system, and there really were no aircraft engines in 1905. But like the Blériot that flew across the English Channel, right? You know that one? Oh, yeah. They used an Anzani engine, and they put those ports in. No valves, uh, because on an airplane, everything's just open exhaust, and That's you don't have collection manifolds or anything else like that. Just open exhaust. And Zanny made a mistake. Uh, I shouldn't say made a mistake. They did it as an ad hoc add-on drilling the holes around for the exhaust that's ported by the piston coming yep. down. Yeah. They didn't think to put in longer piston skirts ah. so that when the piston is at top dead center, those holes went right to the crankcase. Oh. And <laughs> oiling was prodigious. I'll bet it was. That's okay, cool. so like I said, Franklin used these uh, lower double exhaust system from 05 to 1911. Uh, and Zanny did it in 1909, so Franklin had it first. Well, it's quite an advanced car, really, when you think about well, this. It's quite an advanced engine for the age. It's advanced and it's very Baroque. And if it was such a great idea, everyone would still be doing it. <laughs> and realistically, this works fine on an engine that can only run at 1,500 RPM. And if you went, tried to do the same thing on a racing car, you know, just get too much mass mechanic, and, too much mechanical stuff, and yeah. too much mass, and the, and they'd all float. Right. But the advantage of having the concentric valves on an overhead valve system is that if you have side by side valves, the valves can't be much, can't have to be a little bit smaller than half the size of the bore. Right. Right. But if you put one inside the other, yeah. each one can be essentially the same, same size, size as, as the bore. bore. So great, great. So huge valves for a small engine, but it only runs 1,500 RPM. So. Oh, there you go. There you, there go. you go. Quite a car. So Should we're, we we're going to come back and uh, take a look at this a little bit. We're going to be uh, maybe running and driving it. I'm going to uh, give it a few easy turns to get the fuel up into the, up into the cylinders. Then I'm going to turn on the ignition and give it a mighty crank. And if we're lucky, it'll start right up. Nope. 